Hi, thank you so much for staying connected to Passionate Life Church and joining us online. Get ready for an awesome message. Awesome. Welcome to church today. How you guys doing today? You guys doing all right? Awesome. My name is Andrew. I'm the lead pastor. For those of you that do not know me, I want to welcome everybody that is watching us online right now. Thank you so much for tuning in and staying connected to Passionate Life Church. I want to say a special welcome uh, to our watch party in Amarillo, Texas with Rowdy and Kathy. Thank you guys so much for tuning in every single week and staying connected to Passionate Life Church. All right. Uh, we are, I don't know if we're starting a new series or not, uh, I don't know what we're doing, uh, we're just, uh, just kind of following the leading of the Holy Spirit this week, um, and, and just kind of what the message that God has for us today, and, and I think it'll be a two-part series, if we're not careful, it, this, this, this subject could turn into a 20-part series, okay? And so we just, um, and then that's my issue is when I get into it, I just love so many details, and I got a lot of details uh, for us today. Um, really, the, the title of the message uh, today is Jesus and the End of the World. Come on, somebody. And so, uh, you know, the, the, big, the big question when we get into this is how does Jesus want us to prepare for end times, right? How does Jesus want us to prepare? And, um, and so really what, what Jesus is looking for is he's looking for us to store up as many guns as possible, uh, ammunition, get it, get as much as you can, learn how to make it, you know what I mean, in your garage, learn how to make ammunition, um, learn how to self-sustain, okay, uh, learn how to grow your own food, uh, buy property somewhere remotely in Wyoming, Montana, preferably, or North Dakota, bug out vehicles, we need bug out vehicles, um, Lots of conspiracy theories. We need more life groups based on conspiracy theories. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop before someone literally begins to slow clap and stand up, okay? I mean, <laughs> I know. Some of you are like, this is it. This is my moment. Yes! I've been waiting for this, right? Like, um, <clears throat> I'm going to refocus us this morning and uh, just how Jesus wants us to focus and prepare for end times. Now, I'm not against uh, most of those things that I talked about, but that's not, that shouldn't be our, our focus, and, that doesn't, and that's not our, what Jesus wants us to focus on today. Hey, today's the first of the month. We're going to be taking communion today. Uh, it's going to be part of our response time. Uh, and so if you didn't get an all-in-one and you want to take communion with us today, I'll make sure that you get one. Um, as we transition into response time. The only thing that we ask here at Passionate Life Church is that you'd be a follower of Christ to take communion because communion is for the believer. Amen? Awesome. Come on. Let's pray. Father, this is your moment. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can gather together as a community and, and, and just worship you together and, and thank you together and, and grow together in, in, in all things Scripture, Father. And so, Lord, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that you'd help me get out of the way, all of you and none of me, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. So where are we going to start today? Where are we going to start today? We're going to start today uh, with the first words of Jesus, the, the first recorded words of Jesus, and this is 12-year-old Jesus. And the reason why uh, I, I want to start here, and, and you'll, you'll see it, because I believe there's so much wisdom in the first recorded words of Jesus as a 12-year-old, and then we're going to transition into the six warnings that Jesus gives us about the end times uh, of really the labor pains that we should be paying attention to and, and how, we should, uh, how we should be acting and what we should be focusing on, uh, knowing that uh, a lot of these, these signs and warnings have already happened or are currently happening today. Okay, so we're going to start. Uh, basically, um, Jesus, uh, so Jesus' parents, um, they go to Jerusalem and, and they're on their way home. Um, and, and, and so let, let, let's go ahead and, and put the first passage of scripture up there uh, this morning and, and we'll get into it. First passage of scripture, go. Yes. <laughs> Luke 2, 41 through 45. Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. 
After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. First thing to recognize about Jesus' parents, they were not helicopter parents, apparently, okay? (laughs) Lots of trust. But when he didn't show up that evening... They started looking for him among the relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Okay, let's stop there for a moment. Uh, You parents, um, if you've ever lost your child, okay? Now, I'm not talking about losing them for long periods of time, but... Uh, like, have you ever lost your kid, like, like in, the, in, in the supermarket, right, for even for like 30 seconds to a minute? Um, ha- have you ever lost your kid, you know, in Home, du- Home Depot or something? You know what I mean? Like, like you've lost them. And, and how quick, how quick does worst case scenarios start to go through your mind, right? Like, like if you, lose, you, can't, you, you can't see them, all of a sudden you're, you're looking frankly for them. Um, and, and your worst case scenarios start to happen, right? They've been kidnapped, you know, in, in some unmarked vehicle, right? And, and they're on their way to the Mexican border, right? Or, or you know, they're falling down a well somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, they're lost in the woods you know, somewhere. Like, all of a sudden, I mean, literally, it takes literally one to two minutes, and you start thinking worst-case scenarios, right? And, and there's this sense of hopelessness that comes upon us. And, and I feel like it's very similar, the sense of hopelessness and worst case scenarios we feel when we've lost sight of our children or we've lost them for uh, either a short period of time or a long period of time. It's the same. Uh, I feel it's very similar the way many people feel today, uh, thinking that, man, our world is terrible. Our world is horrible. Our culture is terrible, right? And there's this sense of hopelessness of it almost never returning to what we used to remember it being, right? And, and so there, there's this, this similar, sense, the similar sense of hopelessness and worst-case scenarios that begin out, you know, playing in our mind. And so let's continue. Three days later, I mean, can, not, I mean, just think about losing your kids for an hour like not knowing where they are. How about for three hours, right? But three days, okay, three days. And now think about this. Think about the pressure, uh, you know, Mary and Joseph felt. Not only is it their son, but it's also God's son, right? Like what kind of worst case scenarios are they thinking about that, right? Um, okay, uh, God, uh, we got to tell you something, uh, you know, only begotten son thing, uh, lost them. You know what I'm saying? Like, can we get another one? Like, how does this work, right? And so it's, it's three days later, and they finally discover him in the temple, sitting among the religious leaders, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answer. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. And I feel like this is our response today. We like to blame God for our problems and our issues and and what is happening in our culture, right? And this is what they do. They begin to blame Jesus. But why did you need to search? This is Jesus' response, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? I want to read uh, this passage uh, from uh, the New King James Version because I just, I, I like how it's, it's quoted here in Luke 2, 49. He says this, why did you seek me? Did you know that I must be about my father's business? I must be about my father's house. I must be about my father's business. And, and so Mary and Joseph are freaking out, right? Like they're completely freaking out. They're panicking. They're stressed out. Man, they just went through three days of of complete worry and and stress. And this is Jesus' response. What is he doing? He's refocusing Mary and Joseph. He's refocusing to the 12-year-old Jesus, right? He's saying, well, why are you searching for me? I'm about the Father's house. I'm about the Father's business. Guys, no matter what is happening today in our culture, in our world, with the jobs report, in our economy, whatever is happening, what Jesus is trying to get us to focus on is the Father's house, doing the Father's business. Because whatever is going to happen is going to happen 
But Jesus wants us to continue to focus on building his house, building his church, doing his business. Let's, let's finish up with the scripture here in Luke 2, 50 through 50 through 2. But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. What I love this is, man, Mary stored all these things in her heart. And, and man, that, that's what we should do with Scripture. We, we should store these things in our heart. And these warnings that we're going to go through, we should store them in our heart, but we shouldn't panic or freak out about them, right? Because Jesus, and, and Jesus is trying to focus on what is the most important thing in life. It's eternal life. It's our eternal rewards. And he's like, that's why he's like, man, I'm about the Father's house. I'm about the Father's business. So Jesus is with his disciples, and um, they're about to ask Jesus a really important and good question. Uh, Let's pick up in Matthew 24, 1 through 5 today. Jesus was leaving the temple grounds. His disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings, but he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished Not one stone will be left on top of another. This happened about 70 years after Jesus, A.D. Um, This literally happens. Every building, temple was completely destroyed. So this has already happened. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will all this happen? Right? Good question. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. Okay, six warnings of Jesus. We're going to go through six warnings. There's actually a little bit more of the six warnings, but you'll see as we go through those, those are, they're pretty obvious ones, okay? All right, number one, number one, people claiming to be Jesus. People claiming to be Jesus. Over the last, I don't know, 2,000 years of history, um, there's probably been around 1,100 to 1,200 people that we know of that have claimed to be Jesus. Okay, literal, I am Jesus, the Messiah, and people have followed these people, um, and and they've been, you know, misled by these people. Currently today, currently today, um, there is 18 people currently uh, that claim to be Jesus. Okay, you can look this up on the internet. I almost came with pictures, but I did not want to distract you today. Um, it, it's just, you can look it up yourself. I mean, there's, there's Australian Jesus. Um, there's Siberian Jesus. Uh, there is female Russian Jesus. Um, there's cross-dressing Jesus. Okay, very interesting guy. Um, cross-dressing Jesus. Um, there, African Jesus. I mean, there's all types of different Jesuses, uh, people that claim that they are Jesus. There, there's one guy that has like almost 5,000 followers. And so, guys, this, is cur- this has been happening, and it's currently happening today. This warning that Jesus gives us, he said, look, people are going to claim to be me. Don't listen to them. Don't be led astray. All right, let's continue. Matthew 24, 6. Next one. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. So point number two today, uh, warning number two is wars and rumors of wars. I mean, how how many rumors of wars have we heard about? Like, it's almost... Every single day. Uh, I have some interesting statistics I want to share with you today. Uh, you can go ahead and put those statistics up. The, the Upsell Conflict Data Program, which is called the UCDP, the leading provider of statistics on political violence, has identified 285 distinct armed conflicts since 1946. Okay, this is just from 1946 on. That comes to an average of 3.8 wars per year. Okay, and we all know that there was a bunch of wars fought before 1946. This is just, you know, the last 70 or 80 years or so that, that man, almost 3.8 wars a year and, and put on top of all the rumors of wars that have happened. I mean, how many, how many times have we heard that World War III is going to start, right? Like at any moment now, World War III is going to happen. And we, we just constantly hear all of these things. But man, there's, there's wars that are happening every single year. Almost four wars a year are happening every single year. And Jesus is saying, hey, you need to pay attention to these. This, these are warnings. Let's continue. Matthew 24, 
7. Nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. Okay, and, and so point number three, warning number three is famines, okay? Famines. And Famines have been happening, uh, man, for, for thousands uh, of years. And I just wanted to bring not just a past uh, statistic to show you that they've happened in the past, but I want to give you a current snapshot of what's currently happening. And the coronavirus, the pandemic, um, has sped things up uh, very, very quickly. Uh, go ahead and put up that statistic, Jason. A total of 45 million people are on the brink of famine across 43 countries, and the slightest shock will push them over the edge, according to the World Food Program, WFP. And they said that the, the pandemic, the, the coronavirus, has sped things up roughly 10 to 15 million people. Now, you know, it was like 30 million, now it's 45 million people are on the brink of famine uh, today. Just the slightest, you know, economic or, 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 or you know, drought will, will completely, you know, wipe these people out across the country. Uh, go ahead and put up the next statistic. I, I want to show you this, um, all the great famines. Great Chinese famine of 1959 to 61, 20 to 50 million people died. I don't know how you can have such a big gap of 30 million people but it's the Chinese government. So um, <clears throat> Chinese famine of 1907, 25 million people. Chalisa, South Indian famines, 1782 to 84, 11 million people died. Bengali famine of 1770, 10 million people died. The Soviet famine uh, from 1932 to 33, 3.5 to 7.5 million people died. The Russian famine, 1921, 5 million people died. North Korean famine, 94 to 98, like that's really recent, right? 94 to 98, 3 million people died. The Persian famine, 1917 to 1919, 2 million people died. And so not only has this been a historic thing that has happened with, with famines happening, you know, throughout our history, but right now, currently, with all the technology that we have, 45 million people right now are on the brink of famine. And Jesus is saying, look, when we see these wars, right, people, you know, pretending to beat me, right, when, when, when we see these famines happening, right, these are the warning signs to wake up and pay attention, right, that, that Jesus is coming soon. All right, number four, number four, earthquakes, earthquakes. Go ahead and put up the, the statistic. The, the National Earthquake Information Center now locates about 20,000 earthquakes around the globe each year, or approximately 55 per day. There are 55 earthquakes a day happening right now, about 20,000 a year. Now, most of them are not significant earthquakes. So, so, so far this year, there's been about 17 significant earthquakes that are about three, three on the Richter scale on up. But Jesus never says only significant earthquakes would count. He just says there's going to be earthquakes, and there's going to be earthquakes everywhere. And so when this begins to happen, look, we need to pay attention. Matthew 24, 8. But all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. And so Jesus is saying, man, pay attention to these warnings but they're like birth pains, right? And, and the reason why women get birth pains is, is to signal, hey, a baby is coming, right? Like something is coming. And, and, and man, that's what we're experiencing right now. We're experiencing the birth pains. We're experiencing all of these things, these warnings that Jesus says, hey, you need to pay attention. Man, that's what I love about God. We're not flying blind into this thing, right? Like he's given us so many warnings, and literally I could do a 20-part series on all the warnings and things to look out for. This is basically just an intro to the end of the world. Come on, somebody. And, and, and he's just saying like, like and then there's more, there's gonna, more will come. And so we can expect more famines. We can expect more earthquakes. We can expect more, more wars and rumor of wars. We can expect people to, uh, you know, more people to, to, you know, say that they're Jesus, right? Like, like we can expect more of this to come because he says, look, this is only the beginning. This is the beginning of the birth pains with more to come. Okay, let's continue. Matthew 24, verse 9. Then you'll be arrested 
persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. Point number five, killing and the persecution of Christians. The killing and persecution of, of Christians. We are, we are very protected. I, I, I would, what I like to call it is the American bubble, okay? We, we live in this American bubble um, that, man, we're so blessed because the, our forefathers, man, when they came here, the whole reason why they, they created this country is to worship God freely. It was literally the first thing they did was, was got on their face and thank God for this land. And this land has been blessed. It's one of the reasons why we are such a blessed nation. We're such a rich nation. Uh, it is because our forefathers, man, this is the reason why they established this country is so we could worship God freely. And so we, we are the most you know, Christian nation on the planet, right? And so we're, we're in this, this American bubble. And, and, and so, and I'm not going to get into to the specifics of this, but most Americans believe in, in a pre-tribulation. And some of you are like, what is that? Okay, pastor, what is a pre, what is a tribulation, right? So basically, um, most Americans believe that uh, Jesus is going to return for, for the, the Christians, you know, he's going to return for us before things get really bad, okay? But I, if you look at other people in the world, okay, uh, like Iran Christians, Afghanistan Christians, Chinese Christians, uh, Indian Christians, they would look at you and say, how much worse can it possibly get? Like, they're literally losing everything. They're being chased down. They're being hunted down. They are being killed. Their children are being taken away from them and put in work camps. They are being executed in front of their children. And so if you were to talk to, to many of these, these Christians and persecra- persecuted nations, they would say, how can it get any worse than this? And, and here we are in the, the American bubble, right? Right? protected, and, and, and we get all up in arms, right, when, when you, you know, certain, you know, rights, constitutional rights get threatened, right? Man, there's, there's people all over the world that are dying just for professing the name of Jesus. The Center for the Study of Global Christianity, the CSGC, says 900,000 Christians have been martyred in the last deca- decade equating to 90,000 per year in one every six minutes. Just that, let that, that just resonate in your heart and mind and, and just realize how good we have it here. How blessed we are to live in this country and be able to, you know, go to church freely, uh, you know, you know and, and we're not worrying about, some, you know, a government knocking on our door and putting us in jail and, and you know, eventually taking our life. But like, we are so blessed to live where we are. And this is why, man, we have to continue to, to focus on, on giving to missions worldwide and, and man, you, you know, Vapor Ministries. And, and man, we, 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 uh, man, we give a, a lot of money to, to people, different missionaries in different places that Christianity is illegal. Man, we, we have to continue to do this because, man, there's, there's missionaries and people in other parts of the world man, that, that Christianity is illegal. Look at this. Look at this next statistic from Open Door Ministries. Around the world, 360 million Christians face persecution just for following Jesus in 2022, which makes Christianity the most persecuted religion on the planet. And, they, and Open Door Ministries specifically said this. Um, it was about 250 million before the pandemic. And after the pandemic, it's gone up about 110 million, um, just the persecution of Christianity across the world. And one of the things that I find fascinating is specifically the Indian Christians and the Chinese Christians were were talking to different missionaries that come uh, to that area. And, And both of them said the same thing, and I think it's very interesting. And it's this passage in Revelation where Jesus talks about lukewarm Christians, lukewarm people. And they're like, we don't understand this word. Like, like, what does it mean to be lukewarm? And they're like, well, you know, when you don't really, 
you know, want to read your Bible or pray or go to church, and you just kind of coast along, and they're like, what is that? They're like, because Christianity to us means losing everything. They lose jobs, they lose their family, they, they could possibly lose their kids and their life. So they're like, man, we don't, we don't understand this thing called lukewarm. And, and man, the more I study this, I, I think it's more specifically to American Christianity that we just get in this place where we just get lazy. Why? Because we've been so protected for so long. And I do believe, this is my personal belief, I do believe at some point there will be persecution on the American church. There will be. I mean, Jesus says, look, he doesn't exclude America, right? He's like, there will be persecution everywhere. But I just wanted to highlight these things so you know, like, this is happening on extreme levels all across the world. Just because it's not happening in Littleton, Colorado, in our little piece of the world, right? It is happening everywhere else. If you were to ask them, they were like, man, we're in the middle of the tribulation. Like, how can it get any worse than this? And so I, I hope that that's an eye-opening statistic for us today to, to just know, man, to continue to pray for other Christians all across the world. Let's continue. Matthew 24, 10 through 14. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Like, that's been happening forever, right? Like, that's been happening since the beginning of, of time uh, when, when Cain killed Abel, right? Like, this is happening in the beginning of time. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. I, I think we can check that one off. And the love of many will grow cold. Man, we're experiencing this, how, how much divide that we have, uh, not only in our country, but the world. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. Point number six, the good news will be preached to the whole world. Now, because of time purposes, like, like that, man, I could have showed you maps and charts and all types of things um, pertaining to this, this point, right? Because how I used to read this passage is that Jesus is waiting for everybody on planet Earth to get a Bible, right? Like I'm thinking, like that's what has to happen. And, and right now, we've discovered that there's 16,000 uh, groups of people or, or nations, as you would like to call them. And out of the 16,000, 12,000 of, of them have Bibles written uh, in their own language, okay? So there's about 4,000 nations or, or tribes that haven't had a Bible translated into their language. Um, I don't feel like, and that, that, that's kind of like how I always went through it. It's like Jesus is waiting for everybody on planet Earth to you know, hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And, and, and every, like, like, listen, Jesus didn't say I'm waiting for everybody to get saved. That, that's not what he said, okay? He just said that every, every nation will hear the preaching of the good news. And so at some point in time, almost every nation on this planet has heard the good news. There's been a missionary someplace in, in, in every region of the world. Now, it might have been 1785, and the people there decided that they didn't want to choose Jesus. They didn't want to choose, and they ended up killing the missionary, right? And, 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 and so I believe that that counts, okay? Because Jesus doesn't give a time reference. He, he doesn't give very many specifics. He just said, every place will have the gospel preached. And I, I know that we are very close to translating every language on earth into that whatever tribe or, or, you know, that needs that language. And so we're, we're very close to, to people hearing that. But again, I don't feel like this is what Jesus is talking about. Like, like, like every, every people group has an opportunity to, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it doesn't matter what year or what time it was as long as they had an opportunity to hear it. Look, God's the judge, okay? Because people, that's not fair, I don't think that's fair. Look, God's the one who decides what fair and what is not fair, okay? We, man, again, this is why we should be so thankful that we live here, okay? And that we were, we, we're one of the, man, we have so many Christians that live here, and we have so many churches that, that, that are here. Um, 
But I want to read some statistics that were really eye-opening for me um, today just to get, get you a, a perspective. I, I need you to get in the right frame of mind here today of how much work is still needed to be done, okay? So here are, are two abbreviations that I, I need you to, to, to understand, and it, it can be confusing. These statistics can be confusing. Okay, so there's two groups of people. There's a UPG, which is a unreached people group, okay? And then there's a UUPG, which is unengaged, unreached people groups, okay? The UUPGs are considered unengaged, unreached when there are no churches, no believers, no missionaries, and no one engaging them. But that doesn't mean at some point there wasn't missionaries there. That doesn't mean at some point there wasn't churches there. That doesn't mean at one point there wasn't people engaging them. And man, if I could show you a map, you could see that at some point missionaries were there, but they weren't accepted in there, okay? And so out of the 7.47 billion people alive on earth today, it is estimated that 3.15 billion people live in unreached people groups, okay? Unreached UPGs. And, about the six, and out of the 16,000 people groups in the world, approximately 7,000 of the UPGs, unreached people groups, this accounts for 3 billion people. Out of the 7,000 UPG groups, 3,000 are considered UUPGs. Most of these people fall into a region that is often called the thumb people, tribal, Hindu, unreligious, Muslim, and Buddhist. In that unreligious group, they're, they're categorized as nuns. There is a huge population of, of nuns here in Denver, okay? I'm not talking about the nun nuns, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm talking about people that have no affiliation with religion at all. Um, you know, two years ago, or not two years ago, but two elections ago, they, they did a study and, and they asked people to fill out a survey. And over 76% of people in the Denver area checked none. Like, I don't want to be affiliated with any religion. And so, man, not only is this on a, a worldwide scale, this is becoming more and more popular where people don't want to have anything to do with religion, but this is happening in our own backyard. This is very interesting here. There are approximately 350 unreached people groups in the United States. In the United States, there are 350 unreached people groups right here where we live. And so how should we respond to that as the church, right? How should we respond? Well, one of, one of the last commandments that Jesus gives his disciples, I think, gives us a good indication of what we should be focusing on. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on, we, man, wasn't that baptism video awesome? Just, man, that always gets me so excited, man, that you're part of a church that's reaching lost, hurting, and broken people, but are baptizing people in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even to the end of the world, Jesus is saying what? I'll be with you. I'm not gonna leave you. I'm not gonna forsake you. Yes. Thank you so much for staying connected to Passionate Life Church. If you'd like more information, you can email us at passionatelifechurch at gmail.com. Be sure to like, subscribe, or share this with a friend. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.